Okay, so now we have our final speaker of this talk series, Luis Cocola, who will be speaking to us about locally persistent categories and metric properties of interleaving distances. Um, right, so yeah, thanks. Thanks, a lot of thanks to the organizers for basically resuscitating the ATMCS. That wasn't clear that was gonna happen, it ended up happening. So thanks a lot for giving us this opportunity to speak. Um, and then thanks to everyone who's here and everyone who couldn't make it on a Saturday, uh, yeah, for the support. So um, I'm gonna be talking about basically what I did for my PhD thesis. And my, my idea was to find a categorical framework in which interleavings and homotopy equivalences could coexist and benefit from each other and apply that to some uh, problems in TDA. So that's a framework of locally persistent categories that I'm gonna be describing today. And then after some motivation and some definitions, I'll give you briefly some applications and some open questions that are, I think, at least to me, pretty interesting. Okay, so the main piece of motivation is the following. So we probably all know that if you have a persistent topological space, so a topological space indexed by uh, the, by the posit of real numbers, a functor from the posit of real numbers to topological spaces. Uh, if you have one of those and you apply homology to it with uh, coefficients in some field, you're gonna get a persistent vector space. And uh, this construction is stable with respect to the interleaving distances. And uh, as many people uh, noticed, and this was probably made formal, I don't know if the first time, but one of the first times by Bumenik and Scott, uh, that this follows, the fact that this is stable follows from functoriality. So um, what this tells is that, well, category theory has something to say about uh, persistence. Um, and this is the first instance of that. Now, um, if you want to take this idea further, you may say, okay, how do we construct persistent topological spaces usually? Well, usually, or one very often we take a metric space and we apply some uh, filtration, some yeah, filtration functor like Vitteri strips. And if we want that to be stable, uh, well, why would we want that to be stable? Well, because if it's stable, then we compose it with homology and we get something stable. Um, but this is the first problem. If you just take a, a metric space and you apply Vitteri strips, that's not stable with respect to the gromov hausdorff distance and the interleaving distance. And this is not some pathological weird thing. Basically any example you can come up with uh, that has metric spaces with different number of points uh, it's gonna be a counterexample for this. So uh, you may think that that's, okay, that's the end of Vitteri strips, but we know that it's not because this was noticed a long time ago. If you take Vitteri strips and then you compose it with homology, that is stable. So that's stable with respect to the gromov hausdorff distance and interleaving distance. So what's, what's going on here? And another instance of the stability is that if you take a metric space, you apply Vitteri strips and then phi zero, and you get a persistent set, so like a dendrogram if you want, uh, that's also stable. And this is what people know as single linkage. So um, what's going on here? So what is so special about uh, homology and phi zero connected components? And possibly the most natural answer is that they are homotopy invariant constructions. So you may think, okay, maybe if I force the interleaving distance to be homotopy invariant, then Vietoris rips is going to be stable now. And since we are only going to apply homotopy invariant functors to it, we still get the, the nice stability that we always wanted. Um, and what do I mean by homotopy invariant? Well, I just mean that if you have two persistent topological spaces that are homotopy equivalent, then the distance between them should be zero. That's what a homotopy invariant distance is or should be. Um, and this is not my idea. This is something that many people noticed in the past. In particular, Bloomberg and Lesnick define the homotopy interleaving distance that we will encounter later. Um, then Frosini, Landy, and Memoli define uh, the homotopy type uh, distance, I think, um, that is defined on, on filter topological spaces. And then you have other settings such as um, shifts of, um, of chain complexes over the real line, for example, where Kashiwara and Shapira define an interleaving distance. And all of these interleaving distances are homotopy invariant. And they are kind of defining what looks like different ways, um, but they're all settings in which you have interleavings and you have homotopy equivalences and you want to make them coexist 
meaning that you want to have a, an interleaving distance that is homotopy invariant. So this is the this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to find a categorical setting in which all of this could happen naturally and which you could use to prove nice properties about the distances, such as some metric properties. So in order to do this, there are basically two steps. First, you build a theory where interleavings make sense, and then you add the homotopy equivalences. So um, my idea was that if an interleaving is like a, an approximate isomorphism, then it should consist uh, it should consist of two inverse approximate morphisms. Because in category theory, the isomorphism is not a, an atomic notion. Isomorphism is built out, out of morphisms. Morphisms are the atomic notions. So we should we should have a notion of approximate morphism that is more fundamental than interleaving. And then you just build interleavings from two of those. Luis, can I interrupt you for a moment? Yes, please. We have a question from Hitesh, which is in the interleaving distance in, um, in fields of topological spaces, do we have commutativity of diagrams or commutativity up to homotopy? It's commutativity up to homotopy. So I don't know if this is what he's hinting at, the homotopy interleaving distance looks different from the homotopy type in, uh, distance, and that's something we are gonna we're gonna see later. Um, and if that wasn't what he was hinting at, we can talk about it later. I'll, I'll be okay. happy to do that. <laughs> um, so, so yes, we have this fun. We want to have this fundamental notion of approximate morphism, and that's that's what a locally persistent category does. So let's take this idea further. Um, if we want to have a notion of approximate morphism, then for each delta, we should have a set of delta approximate morphisms from X to Y. Um, yeah. And what that leads us to come up with is that HOM from X to Y should be a persistent set. So HOM takes, should not only take X and Y, should also take a delta and then return a set. And this is the set of delta approximate morphisms from X to Y. And if you, if you think of this and you know what an enriched category is, then you're done. A locally persistent category should be just a category enriched in persistent sets. And that's the definition, but I'm gonna unfold it in a second because, um, yeah, because this takes some unfolding to understand, but this is the most, like the most basic idea is that take home and make it a persistent set and you automatically get the notion of interleaving, the notion of interleaving distance, and all that. And I'll explain how that happens in a second. First, let me give you a few examples, just as a sanity check. All of these categories that we are well fond of, persistent topological spaces, persistent vector spaces, persistent sets, these are all locally persistent categories where HOM from X to Y at delta, so the delta approximate morphisms from X to, X to Y are just natural transformations that shift the degree up by delta. So instead of going from X at R to Y at R, they go from X at R to Y at R plus, plus delta. That's what shifting the morphism up by delta means, or the degree up by delta. Okay, so very briefly, let me tell you um, the definition or the unfolding of the definition. So I said that a locally persistent category is a category in rich in persistent sets. So what does that mean? I have a I have a collection of objects, like in any category, so nothing, nothing new here. Now, as I said before, for each pair of objects and each possible positive real number, R, we have a set of R approximate morphisms from X to Y. Um, okay, this, so far this is what we already knew. Then we're gonna have an identity morphism, like in any category, and the, the identity morphism, we're gonna ask it to be a zero approximate morphism. So like an exact morphism. And then uh, we're gonna have the composition operation that does basically what you would hope for. It takes an R approximate morphism and an S approximate morphism, and it composes them and it gives you back an R plus S approximate morphism. Just like interleavings uh, do. If you have two interleavings and you compose them, the length of the interleaving is the sum of the lengths of the interleavings that you started with. Um, okay. And now finally, since the homes should be persistent sets, then they should have structure morphisms. And what that means is that if you have an R approximate morphism from X to Y uh, and R is less than S, then you should have some S approximate morphism from X to Y. That's the structure morphism of the persistent uh, set. 
and and yeah and that reflects the fact that if r is less than s and you have something that respects the structure up to r then it should respect the, the structure up to s and then there are some uh, axioms like in in the definition of category um, identities have to act as identities composition has to be associative and so on um, okay so that's that is the unfolding of the definition it may look esoteric in the beginning but when once you look at at it this way it's pretty natural can I ask you a quick question? Yes, please. Um, so just in terms of it being natural, is there anything awkward about the fact that R here has to be, it's an R plus, whereas I usually think of, I mean, a persistent set could be, uh, you could have any real value. Right. Um, so I think you could, you could let, um, you could let R be anything, but the, the definition of interleaving is only going to make sense when R is positive. Uh, I mean, non-negative. And that's because you can only go up. So uh, we're gonna see in a second that, that that doesn't let you define interleaving if R is negative. Right, so when you say that it's a category enriched in persistent sets, are those persistent sets R plus? Yeah, they are R plus enriched, yes. Uh, I see, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it, that, that's not a big deal because R, I mean, any, you can always extend a persistent set defined on R plus to be defined on the whole of R just mm. by putting the empty set if you want it. So it, it's, it's not a big difference. This is kind of the minimal structure that you need. Makes sense. Um, okay. So let's see how a, a locally persistent category natural comes, naturally comes with an interleaving distance. So... First, we define what an interleaving is. We have some locally persistent category C, two objects, and some non-negative uh, delta. A delta interleaving between these two objects is going to consist of two morphisms, two approximate morphisms, two delta approximate morphisms, one from X to Y and one from Y to X, such that when you compose them, basically an isomorphism, when you compose the, the two morphisms, you want to get the identity. But here you cannot get the identity because F composed with G is a two delta approximate morphism. It's not a zero approximate morphism. And the identity is a zero approximate morphism. So that's where you use the fact that homes are a persistent set. They come with a structure morphism and you use the structure morphism to move the identity from being a zero approximate morphism to being a two delta approximate morphism. And then you ask these two things to be equal. And basically you're just, you're doing the only thing that you can do once you think about this for a second. Um, and then we do the same thing with, F, uh, with G composed with F. Uh, so that's what an interleaving is. And the interleaving distance is defined as usual. It's just an infimum over all delta such that X and Y are delta interleaved. And as a sanity check, you can, you can see that this recovers the usual interleaving distance on any of these categories. Um, okay, so that's step number one. We know how to, what it means for a category to to have a natural notion of interleaving, you just need the home sets to be home persistent sets. Um, so what about, what about homotopy equivalences? And um, so this is the question. If you have a locally persistent category with a notion of homotopy equivalence, how do we make the interleaving distance be homotopy invariant? What does that mean? Um, et cetera. So let's, let's do that now. So usually category theorists and homotopy theorists, when they want to talk about homotopy equivalences, they usually call them weak equivalences. So if I say weak equivalence, just think of homotopy equivalence. And the way they do it is they just consider a category and then they consider some class of maps that they just declare to be the homotopy equivalences. And in our case, we're gonna have a locally persistent category and a class of morphisms that we think of as the homotopy equivalences. And these morphisms are gonna be zero morphisms, zero approximate morphisms. And that's just for technical reasons, but that's, uh, all the cases which you can think of, uh, the, the only natural notion of homotopy equivalence is going to make sense for zero approximate morphisms. Um, okay, very well. Now, if you have two objects, you say that they are uh, equivalent and write it like this. If they are connected by morphisms in W, so if you think of persistent topological spaces, this is just the persistent topological spaces being homotopy equivalent. Um, okay, and now we can say, uh, well, we can start uh, axiomatizing what we want to get. 
a distance on the class of objects of your category is W invariant if it is homotopy invariant. So if, if two things that are homotopy invariant are at distance zero, this is what we want. And this is what it's generally not true for the interleaving distance. So the question is, well, how do we make the interleaving distance W invariant? This is a precise question. And there are two answers. There are two possible answers. And this is what I was uh, talking about uh, earlier uh, with the question, the Hitesh's question. So there are two options. One option is to take the interleaving distance. This is the interleaving distance of C, what I'm highly highlighting right now. And you can take a metric quotient of this interleaving distance. This squiggly thing is an equivalence relation. And you can always take a metric quotient of a metric space by an equivalence relation. And here, if you want to be precise, you have to be working with extended pseudo metric spaces, but that's just uh, a detail. So take your metric space, which is your category with the interleaving distance and take a quotient by this equivalence relation. And that's what the quotient interleaving distance is. And if you want to be precise, you define it to be as, you define the quotient interleaving distance to be the largest distance that is bounded above by the original distance, but that is also W invariant. And you have to check that this exists and is unique, uh, but that's, that's not hard. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, if you are, if you're more into homotopy theory, what you may do is take your locally persistent category C and localize it at the homotopy equivalences. So this is what, what's usually written like so. And in our case, you can check that that is a locally persistent category. So if you start with a locally persistent category and you localize at some class of uh, morphisms, you get a locally persistent category. And now any locally persistent category has an interleaving distance. So just use that one. So the interleaving distance in the quotient category, uh, the IQ is the interleaving distance of the quotient category. And just to repeat, the quotient interleaving distance is the quotient of the interleaving distance. So QI and IQ may be confusing, but this is the quotient of the interleaving distance. And this is the interleaving distance in the quotient category. Okay, so before giving you uh, some, um, some open questions about this and some recent results, let me give you some applications of, of this whole setup. So first of all, there are lots of examples of locally persistent categories. So if you take any category with a flow, this is a framework um, kind of invented by Munch, uh, De Silva and Stefano. This is um, another categorical framework that allows you to talk about interleaving distances um, in a categorical, with a categorical uh, setup. Um, any of these gives you a locally persistent category in a way that preserves both the categorical structure and the metric structure. So in some sense, you don't lose anything by working with locally persistent categories if you really like categories with a flow. Uh, another example is general persistence modules. This is a framework by Wubenig, De Silva and Scott. Again, a categorical framework. Uh, which again, you can turn uh, generalized persistent modules into locally persistent categories um, in a way that again, um, still gives you the, the right categorical structure and the right metric structure. Um, a bit more interestingly, because this is new, um, the homotopy interleaving distance, which at first glance doesn't look, well, I mean, it looks like an interleaving distance, but it, it cannot be phrased into uh, with these frameworks. Um, is a quotient interleaving distance. And that's basically because I was inspired by this sense to define the whole framework. Um, but something a bit more novel is that the gromov hausdorff distance, which is, uh, doesn't look like an inter interleaving distance, um, is also a quotient interleaving distance. So this framework does have lots of known examples and some new examples. Um, now, as most of these uh, frameworks, these categorical frameworks, it has some general theorems that you can prove once and for all. For example, any functor between locally persistent categories is stable. And then you can use that to, for example, recover the stability of Vitoris rips or uh, prove new stability results for density based filtration, such as degree rips, for example. Um, okay. Uh, and then the other thing that you can do is prove some general theorems. Uh, that give you metric properties 
about the distances. So this is kind of a technical theorem. That's why I'm putting it in gray because you shouldn't read it, but um, it just says if you if you have a locally persistent category that is complete and the homotopy equivalences behave nicely with respect to uh, some limits in your category, then the quotient interleaving distance is intrinsic and complete. And for example, you can use this to show, this is a very basic example, but you can show that uh, the interleaving distance on tame persistent sets is geodesic and complete. So these are some example applications uh, of like general theorems that give you some interesting consequences. Um, okay, so let me finish by uh, giving you an open question for which we, I know an answer only in a very specific case. So uh, recall that we given a locally persistent category and some uh, class of homotopy equivalences, we can construct two distances. One is the interleaving distance that you then quotient in a metric way. And the other one is first take a quotient of your category and then consider the interleaving distance. Um, and why am I considering these two cases? Well, because the, 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 inter the, the homotopy interleaving distance of Bloomberg and Lesnick has this uh, form, same thing as the gromov hausdorff distance, whereas the distances of Rossini, Landy, and Memoli, Kashiwara, Shapira, and lots of other distances have this form. They first take a quotient of a category and then consider interleaving distance there. So kind of, it's not obvious which one is better than the other one because people are, are, are using both. So I would like to understand what's, what's the right way to compare this. And there is something pretty obvious that you can, I mean, once you, you write things down carefully, you can see that this one is always bigger than this one, or it's always an upper bound for this one. So besides that obvious observation, what else can be said? Um, that's, that's my open question. And I'll give you an example uh, for which something can be said. So in a recent paper with Eduardo Lanari, we show that if you have a, a covariantly generated model category, such as topological spaces, simplicial sets, uh, chain complexes, um, then uh, you, these two things are Lipschitz, Lipschitz equivalent. Um, and then we use that to, to, to prove a, a version of, of a persistent Whitehead theorem that tells you something like, if you have a map that induces uh, uh, an interleaving homotopy groups, then the homotopy interleaving distance between the spaces is has some upper bound. Um, yeah, and that's all I wanted to say. These are some references, and thanks for thanks for listening. Um, everybody, please unmute yourself and thank our speaker. So does anybody have questions for Luis? Very nice talk, Luis. I had a question on your last slide. Um, so, um, you know, one of your mo motivations, don't, don't go there, but on the very first slide was about how the, you know, the RIPS complex um, sort of not stable in this topological category. So does, does your theorem here with Lenari does that apply to, to that RIPS complex situation you were talking about at the very beginning? Um, so so the, this fix force the, interla the interleaving distance to be homotopy invariant. Um, this is basically what Bloomberg and Lesnick kind of do in their paper, universality of the homotopy interleaving distance. They define mm -hmm. the homotopy interleaving distance, and then they show that uh, Vietoris RIPS is stable now if instead of the interleaving distance you use the homotopy interleaving distance. I see. I see. Um, so what we do with right. Lanari, kind of, is is more of a of a theoretical question because you you cannot really compute persistent homotopy groups because you cannot compute homotopy groups. But right. but the question like the the general question is like suppose that your persistent homology um, like the barcodes are interleaved. So how, what can you say about the spaces? Are they, and then like what you would do is, well, first go from homology maybe to homotopy groups, then go from homotopy groups to um, using Whitehead's theorem to homotopy interleavings. And that's kind of the step that we are taking care of. Right, I'm with you. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. 
can you say again so, what the open oh sorry can you say again oh. what the open question was that you answered on the on the very last slide right so the, 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 the white head theorem that was conjectured that you proved yeah ah right yes so in the paper where they introduced the homotopy interleaving distance they ask okay if you have a map that induces interleavings in homotopy groups what can you say about the homotopy interleaving distance between the the spaces um, and that's basically like the persistent version of Whitehead's theorem because Whitehead's theorem tells you if you have a map that is an isomorphism in homotopy groups, then it is a homotopy equivalence. Um, and then they show by example that the, the persistent version has to be more complicated because it has to do with the dimension of the spaces. It, you're not gonna get like some Lipschitz bound that is independent of the dimension of the spaces. You need to take that into account. But once you take that into account, well, there are no counterexamples, and we show that that is in fact true. Fantastic, thanks. So I have a quick question myself. So um, here you take W to be homotopy equivalences. Um, uh, well, in the homotopy uh, interleaving distance, you really take weak equivalences. So actually, the, that kind of um, relates to my question. So are there different choices for w that in which the theory applies that uh, are of interest in practice or people have been investigated before um so this is i think this is a question that at least i had and i, I some of my friends had when when you start learning about weak equivalences the question is maybe why are you using weak equivalences weren't we interested in homotopy equivalences. And one, que one answer is that things usually behave much better when you use weak equivalences. Um, and that's a, a really vague statement, but for example, if the category of topological spaces has a model structure that's called the storm model structure or storm, maybe it is pronounced, where the weak equivalences are the homotopy equivalences, uh, but that model structure uh, is not cofibrantly generated. And what that means is that in practice, it's really hard. Well, sorry, I think it's not known to be cofibrantly generated. And what that means in practice is that it's really hard to say very much about that. Whereas the equivalent model structure where the weak equivalences are the weak equivalences, you can say lots of things about that. And, and you can do a, you can perform a lot of constructions. For example, here we're using cofibrantly generated in a pretty significant way. And I, I'm not sure how that would generalize. I'm, I'm not exactly sure if you didn't want cofibrantly generation. Um, sorry, and, and I'm going to say something more. You can stop me if, if you're tired of this. But um, the other thing is that um, they're kind of the, 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 this W that we are using here, these are, um, these are morphisms in C. And in this case, C is uh, persistent, say, topological spaces. So these are maps between persistent topological spaces. So um, a, a, a homotopy equivalence between persistent topological spaces, what is it? Is it a, a functor whose, uh, sorry, a natural transformation whose components are all homotopy equivalences? Or is it a full natural transformation that has an inverse? A homotopy inverse as a natural transformation. Um, so there's a choice also there, and and yeah. So I mean, W gives you a lot of freedom in terms of do you use the pointwise weak equivalences? Do you use the pointwise homotopy equivalences? Do you use this like the full uh, homotopy equivalences as natural transformations? There are many choices there, and um, here we are using the pointwise weak equivalences. Is the result still true if you use if you want the the whole natural transformation to be invertible? Um, I think so because um, because uh, so there's this theorem in model category theory where if you have a a weak equivalence between fibrant and cofibrant objects, uh, then you um, 
then that is a homotopy equivalence. So it has a, an inverse up to homotopy. So you will have to be careful because you will have to see that you can replace your objects by vibrant and covibrant ones. Like you have an interleaving and you want to replace both and still have interleaving. So I know that you can do that for simplicial sets um, and thus for topological spaces. I am less sure of whether you can do that in general for some covibrant generated model category. It sounds true though. I think I think you can do that. That's a, that's uh that helps. Thank you. Welcome. Okay.